It's never too late to change a career, but you might have to accept you go backwards before you go forwards. But if you're not satisfied and if you're not burning good energy, how long can you keep doing that for? Life is about experience, knowledge, and about impact. So does it matter what sector you're in? Does it matter what your title is? That's never mattered to me. Learning the nuances of global roles, cool and confident in control, she had led many companies to success. Then as a non-executive director on boards and as chair, I do wonder where she finds time for her rest. People love to help. We think people are selfish. They're not. They're really selfless. Don't be scared of asking anybody at any level or any background any question. Because as long as you're respectful and smile, there's so many people out there that can help people. And go do things you never think is possible in life. And they came out running after me saying, look, if it's money, we'll sort a package. I was like, no, I'm not thinking about money. I'm thinking about the role. I wasn't ready to be a PLC CEO. That wasn't kind of on my horizon. If you make the choices, they're the choices. So don't say, well, if only. Don't look over your shoulder because that's your life, your pack of cards, your hand, whatever they are, you choose how you play them. Greetings, I'm Ashley Samuels McKenzie. And I'm Charles Parkinson. And welcome to How I Became. Where we unveil the unscripted journeys of inspirational figures. If you enjoy the show, could you do one thing? Subscribe. Wherever you are, just click the subscribe or follow button. That simple act can help us grow the podcast in a big way, and we need your support to do it. And if you really want to help play a part in our growth, rate us on Spotify or leave a review on Apple Podcasts. It would mean the world. Thank you. This episode is brought to you by Uber, shaping the future for consumers as they go anywhere and get anything. Advertising on Uber connects brands with hundreds of millions of people using Uber around the world in the moments that move them most. To learn more about what we can do for your brand, visit uber.com forward slash advertising. Hello, I'm Alison Hutchinson. This is how I became CEO of Pennies and hold a portfolio of non-executive roles. Starting life in the west of Scotland with a family that had a host of businesses within the community. She learnt about how customer service and hard work builds the strong bonds of family and social unity. Customer is king was the values that ring from her early years of working experience. While she flourished in dance, despite how others glanced and made comments to drive her to think about her appearance. Learning the nuances of global roles, cool and confident in control. She had led many companies to success. Then as a non-executive director on boards and as chair, I do wonder where she finds time for her rest. She spent her career leading banks and finance departments. So for numbers, she has seen more than many. Introducing Alison Hutchinson, CBE, CEO of the charity initiative, Pennies. Oh, wow. That's amazing. <laughs> welcome. Now I know why I'm so bad with words, but that was absolutely touching. <laughs> Thank you, Ash. You're very welcome. There we go, your life in a poem, and now for the real story. And to, before we get started on your story, uh, I want people to, to get an idea of who they're, lis who they're listening to today, because there's going to be some great advice here from great experience on business models, on how to start a non-executive director career, which you've done, on how to, to, yeah, to run great businesses, and also how to make a change in your career at a later stage as well, um, which is all things that you've done. And you've also, in your time, which we'll get into the story of, but I want people to know that this non-executive non director career, just name the companies that you've um, been a non-exec at. Yes, well, I started, my first non-exec was when I was 43, and that was L Max, which was a subsidiary of Betfair. I've also been a non-executive director at Liverpool Victoria, Aviva Life, Aviva General Insurance Business, Yorkshire Building Society, Foresight that focuses on sustainability, and DFS. <laughs> just a few. Just a few. Just a few, yeah. <laughs> and so on the next series of How I Became, we will be in DFS sofas and chairs. Yes. Excellent. I will have a word. <laughs> <laughs> no, great. <laughs> um, and so, so yes, uh, a, a, a load of um, really interesting experiences you've been through from the business side and now you're in the world of charities you didn't weren't always in the world of charities so it's going to be interesting to share that transition and that story and why because it wasn't planned it wasn't planned but then taking opportunities and following your purpose can be quite enlightening 
there we go the advice has started already <laughs> it's there the gems are there okay um pennies what is it you know pennies is just such a simple thing the most favorite way of giving for years has been dropping coins in a charity box mm -hmm. It makes you feel good. It gets the coins out your pocket and they all add up to making a difference. And what we identified about 14, 15 years ago was we're starting to go digital. E-commerce was flying and we're starting to go cashless. Yeah. So our core premise was how can we protect that behavior that charities so value, that consumers love and just bring it up to date. So we've been on a mission to make it easy and affordable for everybody to give wherever they choose to retail, whichever channel they're on, and those monies add up to going to the charities nominated by the retailers. So in a nutshell, that's what we're trying to do. And, and what excites me is, if you think about leaving a legacy of giving, then that's what we're trying to help pennies achieve. Because if every UK adult gave the equivalent of a chocolate truffle once a week, that would be a billion pounds of new money for the UK charity sector. And that's just in the UK alone. So if anyone questions whether a humble penny is worth anything, I can tell you, put them together, put them to work, and they can make lasting difference in our communities. And that's what makes it really exciting for me to be on this journey. Love it. Brilliant. And tell us how many microtransactions have been made through pennies. Well, we smashed through 200 million last year, mm. so we're heading towards 250 million. Um, and that's raised 50 million pounds for nearly a thousand different charities. And, and I think what's amazing is whenever a retailer goes live, consumers just donate. And in today's world, when we are all, let's face it, looking after our pennies in our pocket, because it has got much more expensive to buy the things that we want to buy, we've had to make some difficult choices. The generosity of people is just phenomenal. And when they quite often think, well, I'll give a few pennies, it doesn't really mean anything. But if you take Domino's, for example, who was our first partner to, to take Pennies Live, mm -hmm. we wanted to go for a small brand, but hey, we went with Domino's. <laughs> and they're only going to trial it for three months. And it went live. And, you know, and I remember to this day, and every 10 minutes now, their customers' Pennies funds an hour of care for a teen teenager fighting cancer. Wow. And that's the pace of coming together. And when we first went live with Domino's, I never knew it was a thing to be able to get a Domino's at 10 o'clock in the morning. Clearly, later in life with teenage children, I do understand <laughs> why Domino's is so successful at 10 o'clock in the morning. But we were poised, ready for it to happen. We had bought our sandwiches. We were ready to go. We were ready to press the button. And we were only fourth to donate. And that's when we knew we were really onto something special because it was three people. We don't know who they are because we never track the donations or the individual. We track every single penny from where it comes, where it is, where it goes and the impact it has but it's all anonymous. So people can do what they want to do. If they choose to do it, it's because they feel happier about it. But there was three people that got in there before us for which I'm hugely thankful because <laughs> it gave us that little bit of confidence that we really were onto something in the very early days. How exciting. Um, some other places, Curry's, JD Sports, Boots, Poundland, Screwfix, all places where mm. you can donate your extra pennies. Absolutely, Palmer's absolutely. Big, big organisations. Well, we are, and we started out making, because uh, quite a lot of time in the early days, people said, focus, just go in one sector, just go in one area. And we deliberately made the opposite decision, where the two tough decisions we made in pennies, but I think were the right ones. One was to set ourselves up as a charity. We don't want to make any money out of this. We want to be an absolute force for good. And the other was to be independent, independent of channel, independent of retailer, independent of charity. Because with that vision of wherever you shop and pay for something, you can't be constrained. And so that was quite a tough, but a really, really good decision. So it meant that we've got football clubs and DIY and restaurants and fast food and uh, high street retail, a whole range, because that's brought a whole range of new technology partners, which means even more brands can join in more quickly. Mm -hmm. and, and actually that's been true because despite COVID, we still grew about 5% over those years. Oh, but in the last couple of years, we've grown about 30% year on year as more brands come on board and more consumers want to give in this way. So it's, um, it's exciting and we've hardly begun yet. Yes, how exciting. So, and this is the interesting thing is you t people will hear you speaking now and think, oh yeah, 
she lives and breathes the world of charity and everything. But this is this is the story we're going to tell. You've you had a long career in in business, in big business before this, and technology. So uh, we're going to learn a lot about how great businesses are run and uh, and how to make this transition into a very purposeful uh, career. Yeah. So let's go back. Let's go back in time. Around aged eight, you get your first almost unofficial MBA, <laughs> a fast track into learning business. Tell us a bit about that and who were the Charlie's Angels? Oh, bless you. Well, Charlie's Angels, Charlie was my dad. Sorry, Charlie, I know you're a Charles. I've got that now. But <laughs> Charlie was my dad and I was very close. We were very lucky to have a very close family. And my mum and dad were a little entrepreneur team. Uh, they started in the flat above a betting shop and everything they achieved, they achieved for themselves and ultimately had dry cleaners, bed and breakfast, electrical contracting firms. And Charlie's Angels was my mum, my sister Margaret, who I love very dearly, and myself, although I am the baby, so I just need to get that in there. It's very important I'm the baby. But uh, when we ever had to do anything, we were always put to work. So the minute we could walk and talk or do something, we were part of Charlie's Angels mm -hmm. that had to work in the business. Mm -hmm. and, and you mentioned that time when I was eight, and I do remember it really vividly. It's one of my first memories. And it was, um, when you do an electrical contracting tender, mm -hmm. you would have lots of things like a thousand cables of, a thousand meters of this cable, 500 sockets, junction boxes. So we had all of the list of what they needed. And dad would put the price of all the individual elements. Mm -hmm. And I had to do the arithmetic to do a thousand at 5p and 500 at 20p and then add it all up. And dad would say to me, now make sure there's no mistakes because if there's a mistake, we won't eat next week. And I used to go, surely you're going to check it? No, I'm not. It's on you. Now, I'm sure in hindsight, of course he checked it because there's no way he's going to let an eight-year-old get this wrong, given the business. But I never knew that. So from a very early age, I had to learn ways in which I was sure it was as right as it could be to check and balance and make sure I reduced the risk of us not having any tomato soup the next week. What did you, what did you learn about life, about business at this early age that may have bolstered some skills in you for later life? Well, I guess what I learned was the very simple business model, which I live by today, and actually is what mum and dad taught us, which was customers are king. Um, you absolutely need to attract the best colleagues and staff you possibly can, mm -hmm. and in doing so, look after them. Mm -hmm. We learned that family first environment where if somebody needs to go and do something, whatever it is at work, you need to let them go. Because actually being flexible to look after people's lives mm -hmm. and look after them as well as you can is really important. So once you've got these colleagues, look after them. Then it was all about cash flow, not about profit. It was make more money than you spend. Quite simple, but absolutely fundamental. And then give back to the community in which you're operating. And particularly as a small business, you need to be really clear that you're supporting the community. And dad would be involved in Rotary and he'd be involved in charity events and he'd be involved in so many different things in the community, which meant Charlie's Angels followed, that we actually learned from a very early age how to juggle a number of things, be at school. I did some dancing, work in the business, learn to give back to the community and do it all with a smile. So that was the kind of background to, to, to which I was growing up and never knew anything different. And then when I look back now, I don't think they realized the gift they were giving us, albeit sometimes I'd be like, why am I serving the dry cleaner and every other girlfriend I've got is out in the park? I didn't quite understand it then. But when you look back, it was really quite phenomenal. And let's face it, we were quite cheap labor. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and then fast tracking a little bit to 16 where most 16 year olds would be looking at A-levels you yourself was actually starting up at university tell us a little bit about that yes I went to university fairly young I mean I think in Scotland you can go to university younger mm -hmm. but even by those standards I think 16 was quite young uh, we actually had a reunion for 40 years since we'd all started out together and they kept calling me the baby, which was true. <laughs> Quite often I am the baby, so I was a baby in that, that group. But I think I never really fitted in at school. Um, I only had one friend at school who sadly passed away. I was one of those people where school was more a ticket to learn. And once I had a ticket to learn, it was then, where can I take it from there? Mm. And so I was the first person to go to university. Um, none of my family had had that privilege. Um, we couldn't afford for me to go away, so I went to Strathclyde, and that meant I could keep with my dancing. I actually went to drama school. I was working in the local business, and I was studying. Wow. And so it was quite a, yeah, you had to manage your energy and your time really, really carefully, but it was such an honour. And the course I did, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I just knew I wanted to learn, 
Uh, I'm a great believer in learning every single day of the week. And so my brother-in-law, actually, Fraser, he'd done a course called Technology and Business Studies at Strathclyde. And I thought, what, an, what a great idea, because I'd always have had a view that technology would be what would end up transforming businesses and lives when you can automate and make it more efficient. And so what was unique about that course as well is not only did I particularly focus on engineering and actually operational research, um, every once every week you'd go out into a business and find out about a problem or a project and then the next week you'd have to come back and present it. And I think that was ahead of its time, recognising you can be as bright as you can be, but if you can't communicate to audiences and influence people and tell a story, then actually it's not as easy to succeed in business. So I was very blessed mm -hmm. to learn from my brother-in-law, pinch his idea, why not, it was great, and uh, do it at quite a young age. That's great. Yeah, I love that element of putting people in the real life situations, the scenarios to learn, because it's so important. When everything's, so, when everything's learned from a book, you can learn a lot of knowledge, but it's not applicable. Whereas that kind of approach allowed you to kind of see, all right, this is a real world challenge and, you know, these are, these are possible solutions we could bring. Yeah, and I think at the time I didn't know I was learning. And mm. I think that's quite a blessing because, you know, I, we might talk about leadership, but I think naivety is quite helpful sometimes because it stops you holding yourself back because you can yeah. be a little bit raw and go for it. And so I didn't know that that's what I was doing. I was just doing what I had to do. But by doing that, you get all these experiences in your backpack that you can take with you through the rest of your career. Yeah. So you mentioned you mentioned that you were a dancer, mm -hmm. a tap dancer, or or many different disciplines. Yes, we did quite a few disciplines: mm -hmm. tap, ballet, modern jazz, Highland acrobatics, kind of various different disciplines across the piece. Tap was my love. Mm -hmm. I was never actually technically very good at dancing, but I could get it across on the stage. So I was very lucky to become Scottish tap champion, for example, and ran and won a number of trophies across dancing. But I was I had to work at it. I wasn't a natural dancer. Um, Indeed, I wasn't a natural shape for a dancer. I was quite small and quite tubby and used to get teased quite a lot for how come she can dance when she's not the right shape to be able to dance. And I think that's quite sad, really, particularly when so many people get hung up about their body shape. Um, but because I was in a small dancing school and we didn't have many people that did OK, which I did OK, but believe you me, it was much easier to do well in Scotland than it was in England with a much smaller community. Um, but I do remember one time when we were actually, I was going down to the British Championships, both the ballet and the tap and, and the likes, um, but I was a bit the wrong shape. So my dancing teacher used to wrap my legs in cling film, make sure I didn't drink any water and sent away to America to get a black ballet dress to make me look a little bit thinner, which never really got there, but uh, certainly not through the ballet dress. But in due course, like anything, I was a late developer. So I did suddenly grow six inches in six months and suddenly became a very different shape. But, you know, it's quite hard when people then would comment more about what your body was like rather than actually what you were doing, mm. which always put you a little bit in the back foot, particularly when you're relatively young. You're trying to form those areas of life and what's important. But I had huge support from my family. It was more that how do you fit in a little bit, which made it a bit challenging for me. But I kept going anyway. Excellent. And from there, you had an experience at kind of stepping up in competition level and faced a few challenges. Share a little bit about that with us. Yes, well, I think it's when I went to the British Ballet Championships, um, it was just really quite, quite amazing about how many talented people there were. And because I had got all this discipline of training and then I'd got the black ballet dress and I'd, I'd literally, I would you know, be out in the studio four hours a day, every day when I wasn't working. I was in the studio. I was trying to perfect what I was doing. My pirouettes were never good enough. I slightly moved slightly. I would, you know, and I had, had this mirror and I would study everything to be the best I could be before I went. Um, and then when I went down, I did pretty well in the early rounds. And then my dancing teacher decided to spray hairspray over my point shoes because she thought that would make it stickier on the stage. And here's me getting quite well through the competition and end up falling flat in my face when I was doing my 16 pirouettes in the middle of the stage, which then I just slipped and fell. And it took a lot. I pulled myself together, stood up and actually finished my routine. Um, bless the judges. They put me through to the next round, but I couldn't do it. My ankle was the size of a tree trunk. Um, but when you think of the hours and hours and years and years of energy you put into trying to achieve it, you know, 
maybe it wasn't the hairspray, but I can tell you it was as slippy as heck. Mm. But it was only because she was trying to do the right thing. It just happened to maybe not have been. But boy, did I learn a lot from how you pick yourself up, dust yourself down and just keep going. And I think that's really important in life. I think a, a lot of people will, will have faced maybe now or at some point in their time insecurities about their body. Um, if you could sort of go back in time and speak to yourself back then, knowing what was going on in your mind and, and the thoughts you were saying and to yourself, what would you say to yourself? It's a really good question, Charles. I think I'd be saying to myself to spend a bit more time to love yourself. I was loved by my family. I mean, I was very lucky. I had a hugely loving family, but I don't think I loved myself. Um, I still find that quite hard, if I'm honest. But it's, I was so focused on, okay, well, I need to achieve things then. I need to not let people down. I need to be out there. I need to do things. I need to prove that I'm not as bad as they think I am. Whereas I don't think I was that bad anyway, but I created this belief system inside me that I just wasn't good enough. And therefore it drove me to try and do more of the what, but feel less of the, so what am I learning from? I just would keep going and keep running which meant in some ways you got a little bit more lonelier inside, even though from the outside people were saying, oh, well, she's confident, she's achieving, she's doing, it must be fine. Actually, if I went back to myself, I would say, make sure you remember it's as important to build your own inner strength and inner confidence as it is to achieve, because I think achievement is sometimes based on your own expectation rather than others, even though you think that's the case. So I think... For me, the biggest bit is make sure you can speak to people honestly, rawly. Don't believe you're alone with it. And actually just give yourself a little bit more love. Mm. That would be the advice I'd love to give to myself. It's a great, great message. Um, now, you're, we get to the stage after this. You, you get to, you're 21 years old. Um, there's a lot of great things going on in the family at this time. And then something happens that really... Is, is, is a very sad moment for the family. Can you just share, firstly, what was going on with the family at the time and then, and then what happens? Yeah, that was a, that was a tough old year. Um, it was 1988. I was 21 in the February and we had surprise, surprise, a family party, um, which is what we did. Um, it was then my sister was, uh, got married in the April and that was a fantastic family celebration. And my dad, who was also twinkle toes, he was as wide as he was tall. So let's face it. And he was a little naughty where he'd say, I'm always on a diet. Why can't I lose weight? And it'd be, well, there's half an inch of butter on top of the shortbread, dad. Maybe, <laughs> maybe that's part of the problem. Um, but he was an amazing man, larger than life. And as I say, the real kind of local individual that got so involved in so many areas. And then it was my mum and dad's 25th wedding anniversary. And we didn't often travel. We holidayed at home. Uh, or we went down to Patna to my aunt's, or we managed to get to Butlins or Pontins. And so mum and dad went away to Guernsey. And sadly, my dad dropped dead in my mum's hotel bedroom in the middle of their 25th wedding anniversary. Sorry, even now you oh. think, whoa. Yeah. Um, and my mum was amazing. And I had two, two great friends I'd met in IBM, Dave and Tricia. And I, I still to this day, I don't understand how amazing they were because they had to come and tell me when I was sitting at my office working late, as I typically did, mm. yes, let's not talk about me being a workaholic, but anyway, mm. I know, self-professed, I am. But I was just sitting there and I just did not believe it. It was just, we were just, it was a year of celebrations. And, and to this day, bless David and Trish, they got me in a car because I was in Newcastle. They drove me all the way home. I met up with my sister and a few friends. And then we flew out to be with my mum in Guernsey. And of course it was complicated because he was in Guernsey and it was very sudden and there was nothing that could have happened and then we had to fly his body home and then try and arrange kind of a funeral for this amazing man that died at 52, far too young. And of course, because it was a family business, back in those days, it was all joint accounts and everything was frozen. Mm -hmm. So back to the lesson mum and dad told us about worry about cash because profit will come. We had no cash. So we were trying to borrow. We were begging with our bank manager, who was brilliant after a couple of weeks. He managed to get somebody high up to release a bit of cash that we could pay for the funeral. And, and it was just a really, really traumatic time when we thought everything was going to be amazing. And suddenly Charlie's head of Charlie's Angels had gone. Um, but it probably made the angels even closer. 
which is a good thing. And dad lives on in so many of our memories. But it's just so hard when someone that was so amazing and had such a big impact in your life goes so suddenly. And I feel for anyone that doesn't have the opportunity to say the goodbyes that they'd want mm. or to share the stuff that they'd want. And therefore, you just have to work harder on your memories. But that was, it was quite tough. I was only 21. And, um, and at the time, we then, IBM were, as IBM always are, certainly when I was there, fantastic. They gave me time off. My mum, my sister and I worked out what we're going to do with these portfolio of businesses because none of them were big. They were all local entrepreneurial businesses. And we gifted the electrician to my cousin who took it on. We sold the bed and breakfast because it gave mum a little bit of money to start to build a pension. And then my mum took the training business that was very, very nascent at the time and realised that my mum was also the entrepreneur behind Charlie and that Betty and my sister Margaret made this amazing training company called Training Encourages Local Learning, TEL. Mm. And they made it a fantastic business in the west of Scotland where I helped a little bit from afar, but it was really their fantastic work. So, yeah, I guess in our bones, our entrepreneurial work hard, just find a way through these things, make a decision, find a way through. It's been very much part of my journey. Love that. Um, and and do you have any advice for, for someone who may go through something similar where someone who's such a core integral part of your life and the family um, passes away and, and looking back how you managed it or what you would do differently and how to handle such a difficult situation which everybody faces at some point I think I went very numb and probably back to some of the earlier parts in life I'd focus on what needed to be done rather than how I was feeling so then I was into how do I help mum and mags work out what we do how we do it we would so I got a little bit into doing mode <laughs> um as I think a number of people do in circumstances mm. like that um, but I think that continued for quite a long time afterwards and it's only over the decades, I've let myself remember and love all the moments I remember of dad. And I think if I could have done that earlier in life, that would have been a much better thing to do. But I was lucky. I mean, I was so close to my mum. She was my best friend. I'm really close to my sister. And they are our unit. You know, we had a family unit where I didn't have as many friends. My friends were my family. And so I was blessed with a hugely tight unit, which if, if you're not blessed in that position, my real advice is get somebody you can really trust that you really can share, sob, laugh, love, because everybody needs somebody. And if it's not your family, there's loads of people out there and there's also loads of help out there. But don't feel you can do it alone because I'm not sure very many people can do that and do that successfully because these things are tough. Mm. Oh, great advice. That's very true. Um and as you mentioned, at this time, you were at IBM, which is a company you would later be given a CEO role at, um, as we mentioned before, um, and uh, and, turn, and and get this this part part of the business you're running to to a billion turnover in two years. But you started way back at the beginning. Can you just tell us where it, where it's, where this began, where the story began here? Yeah, so IBM are an amazing company and I think what I was so impressed by is regardless of your background, your gender, your race, they were about talent and building talent and growing talent. And so I was very lucky because when I did leave university at 19, um, they were trying to encourage me to stay for an honours degree. Um, and, and again, I, I'm not really that bright. I work hard, but I'm not that bright. Um, but I do work hard and I'm not bad at getting through exams. But I suddenly had a fantastic opportunity with all the milk ground, which is what they called it in the time, where you would have big companies like Marks and Spencers and IBM and you know various others where I was offered a huge number of roles. So given my view was education was a ticket to getting a role and that role could get you to financial sales sustainability, which was something mum and dad really strive for for so many years to be able to make the cash flow mm. um, then for me I went to IBM and IBM were fantastic and it took me to Newcastle uh, which was where I first worked so it's the first time I'd moved away from home um, I remember vividly my salary was 8,640 and I bought a flat at uh, 19 it was 21,000 so I bought my one little bedroom flat in Newcastle you just couldn't do that these days when you look at salaries and actually mortgages you couldn't do it but I mortgaged out um, I 
learned that porridge and egg mayonnaise were my favourite food because they're the cheapest things you can buy. Mm. And actually they're quite nutritional because I spent all my money in my mortgage. But I kind of had that sense of belonging. This was this was the beginning of my journey. Mm -hmm. And IBM were fantastic. I was a systems engineer. I did some development at a time when, gosh, when I think now we were developing some middleware software, it was called Kix, where we were separating out the trans, the terminal owning region so you could get more terminals on in one of the, the CPUs. And then there was the application region, which it did all the logic, and then there was holding all the data. And that was a big development to try and split them so you could get a bit more performance. I mean, I think all of that's done within seconds in our iPhone now. It's quite uh, remarkable. Yeah. But there was a lot of hard work to get there. And then I went on to be uh, one of the top salesmen. I was marketing director in the UK just in my mid-20s. And then I guess the I also helped with governance. So we did a big governance piece across Europe where they were moving it to being more industry-focused rather than country-focused. Mm -hmm. And I was part of a team defining the blueprint for how this should work, which I had no idea, but thankfully amongst us, we found a way to do it. Um, and then I nearly left IBM. Uh, I nearly left, Microsoft kind of got to me, so I nearly left to go to oh. Microsoft. Uh, and I remember uh, Nick Temple at the time, who's again sadly passed away just recently, he got hold of me and um, yeah, the history is that I wasn't able to leave IBM. He said, nope, there's too much opportunity or you cannot do it. And so I stayed and uh, that's not something I would commend people to do because I think if you've made a decision to leave, mm. you should leave. I think I was probably a bit naive in my decision to leave. I was caught up by somebody tapping me on my shoulder and here's another great company. I could learn the whole software growth as well as the hardware. So I was probably just a bit naive. But anyway, I did stay and it was the best thing I could have done. So you told you told IBM you're leaving and then he was like, mm, no, you're not, you're this is the where you need to be these are interesting okay. it was and um and again it's it's I, it's it's not something i'd recommend you make a decision to go and you stay but sometimes people can really influence what's really important and what you could learn and um they gave me an opportunity to run a business that was called the smart car business which was one of my mm -hmm. most challenging roles early in my career um, where they were worried at the time that it was a bit like where Microsoft took the software from laptops and IBM became the big hardware provider, but really it was all about software. Mm -hmm. They were worried that putting chips on cards, you know, our contactless cards as we know them today, mm -hmm. they were called mul multifunction cards then, MFCs. Because before this, you had to swipe. Is this, this is yeah, in the swiping you had to days. Swipe, well, yeah. Before the, the chips came in, you could Exactly. Tap. Yeah. But this is, I mean, I'm talking, oh, about 30 years ago, IBM were ahead of their time wow. in identifying this technology, which mm -hmm. we all now just assume is part of our everyday life of contactless chip and pin, but it was just evolving. And so their challenge to me was, what is IBM's position in this global smart card market so we don't make the mistakes we made with Microsoft? Mm -hmm. And it was sponsored by Lou Gerstner in the States, who was our CEO at the time, and Prof McGregor, who was the research and development director at the time. Um, and so they gave me, as a kind of business unit, bits all over the world. Uh, so we had research and development in the States. I had a development arm in Germany. We had a distribution in the Netherlands. We had a piece out in China where I was working with the MEI government in China to try and share our combined insights into what was happening with this business. And so as well as the sales team. So it wasn't like a proper business because you didn't have all of the IT and HR and governance and risk. But for IBM, it was quite unusual because they were trying to find a strategic game plan. Um, so that was definitely quite an interesting role for me. And the first time I went outside to go to the States and walk down Armonk where there was just these ginormous wooden doors that were like ceiling to floor. And what's Armonk? Armonk is a place out in America, just outside New York. And it was one of IBM's head offices. And it was just so scary because everyone seemed to know what they were doing and I didn't have a clue. And you're in your <laughs> 20, 20s. Yeah. Yeah, it was quite daunting, really. And um, yeah, and then you get the funny side of so when you were preparing the strategy and you were working it through and we had to go and present it to make sure we got support. And I remember vividly that um, all my family, well, my husband and their family were all away at a family party at the weekend and I had to finish this presentation. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it's a little bit like when we when we started earlier today, I said, I've looked at the technology, so it's probably broken. <laughs> so I've been working on this major presentation and I'd done research upon research. And I kept thinking of every single question and asked everybody around IBM, what could they ask me? 
what do they want to know? So I kept asking what the questions. So I had hundreds of questions and I had answers to them all. And then I had to pull it together into this proposal and this presentation. And my laptop failed me and oh, I lost it all. No. And I really did cry, but that was just a silly cry. So I packed it all up and went down to Brighton where all my family were. Um, you know, and, it, and, and at this time I was pregnant uh, with my first child. Um, I remember the red cabbage didn't go down at all well. Um, but it was quite a stressful time. And then I came back on the Monday, I dusted myself off and you think you've forgotten everything. And then you've just got to remember that those months and years of work that had gone into your head haven't actually gone, mm -hmm. even although you believe they'd all gone in that moment of technology nightmare. Um, and then I started to recreate it. And actually, on reflection, it was probably better the second mm -hmm. time than it was the first time mm -hmm. because I was less into the detail and more into the story. Um, yeah, and then when when I did go out to uh, out to Armonk and when we did the final presentation, ironically, they actually agreed with my recommendation, which I was gobsmacked about because the reality was there was never going to be a software platform, which is what we found out today. You know, kind of thirty years later, there wasn't going to be a software platform. It was more about the technology and the chip and the what's going on inside the chip. You were never going to sell software that ran the chip on that card. And yeah, so we went back to using some of our own manufacturing firms to take to chips and to implant them into the plastic cards, which is where IBM ended up deciding they would go. But my goodness me, what a journey I went through. What a journey, yeah. goodness me. Um, and we're going to come back to some sort of advice because, as you said, you had to set a vision and a plan and a strategy. And I want to come break down that a little bit. But all the while this is going on, um, a few life events happen. And let's go back to... The romantic journey or story. <laughs> it's um, 1994. You go on a skiing trip with your good friend. Yeah. And you meet someone out there. Tell us a bit more about this. Yes. So, a um, bit random for me, mm -hmm. it has to be said. I quite like, as hopefully you've gathered a little bit to be a bit of a planner, mm -hmm. sort things out, work things through. And I went to skiing in Holdworth with my lovely friend Trish, who was the lady that was amazing when she told me about Dad and looked after me brilliantly. And so Trish and I were just going on a skiing holiday. I didn't know anything. Uh, what I didn't know was friends of Trish, um, who was working with David, who's now my husband, and we're 30 years together this year, um, he had choice of two skiing holidays. One was to go with all his mates, and the other one was to come w on this skiing holiday where seemingly there was a girl going who was described, and I'm not particularly proud of this, but as blonde hair, good fun, likes rugby and can hold her drink. I'm not sure that's a really good criteria. I'm not sure how David decided that's what you wanted to go after. That's how we should have started the show. With the <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that was me. So yeah. anyway, probably all true, actually. Yeah. Um, but um, yeah, and so he came out in a mission to find me. So on day three, he proposed to me. And I think it was... Um, yeah, and I said to him, don't be absolutely ridiculous. I've just he, met you. He proposed three days after meeting you? He did. Wow. wow. And I said no. But then on day five, a couple of things happen. One is David's got this brilliant technique knot of taking an upside down creme caramel and being able to eat it without any cutlery. So he just sucks it up. So clearly I was really <laughs> impressed by that skill because not many people have that I skill, mean, do they? Who would I mean, fall for that? That, was, uh, that was, I really fell for that. Mm. And then we had what we called the on balcon session, um, which was on the 17th of January. And actually that's when our youngest daughter was born, ironically, all oh, these wow, years later. Wow. Uh, and 17 is my lucky number for other reasons. But uh, I went through all the reasons why this partnership just would not work. And at the end, he said, so you've no more reasons? No. Nope. I said, OK, let's do it. <laughs> and so by day five, I kind of gave in. Uh, so we didn't get married then, but we kind of knew we were on a journey. And, and, and interestingly, you know, David was the individual up in the northeast who drove everybody to the airport. I was the individual down in London that drove everybody to the airport and dropped them all off. And that very day, we then re-met up in a travel lodge in the M1 halfway up and down. Um, and David bought me this picture of everybody in his family and friends who it was going to be. And I had a little red car. It was my love at the time my little red sports car and uh, we sat in the sports car and David played as this is going to be our song. I said, do I get a choice in this? <laughs> and he was like, no, and it was feels like forever. And uh, and from there, that was it. Um, and I remember telling my mum and I obviously had this exciting voice on and she was like, oh, Alison, just tell me it's not the ski instructor. I said, it's worse. <laughs> He's English. <laughs> 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 Which my mum was like, oh. And he came to be uh, my mum's favourite 
English son-in-law and she's her favourite Scottish son-in-law. So that was quite helpful in the end. <laughs> but yes, so all of this logic, maybe there is something called love at first sight. I don't know. Lovely. Oh, a lovely story. That was a lovely story. And then, so we fast forward a couple of years. 1996, you have quite a high, high important role where you're travelling quite a lot. Now, you're in Birmingham at the time. You get a call, I believe, that forces you to drop everything. And this is around David. Yes, it is. I was actually in London at the time. My husband, David, was in Tamworth, just outside oh, yeah. Birmingham. Um, I was just over six months pregnant with now Naomi. I had this big e-net, uh, this big smart car job, sorry, I was telling you about where I was trying to work out the strategy. And I'd heard that David was, he, they thought he had ammonia poisoning and he'd collapsed when he went on the side of a road in his car and had to get an ambulance to take him to hospital. And so I dropped absolutely everything and just went to Tamworth to find out what was happening. And um, when I did, I found him, like many a and and again, I just take my hat off to the many NHS workers that work so hard for us all when we're in need, because they're all really brilliant. But it was really busy. And because they thought my husband had, a, had ammonia poisoning, he was left on a trolley, shivering, just in a corridor, because there was much other bigger issues that were happening. And so I, I was just heartbroken and I stayed with him and they were so busy. And then it got to the change of shift in the early hours of the next morning. And there was this one amazing consultant that just came over and said, what is wrong? You look ill. I said, well, my husband's been shivering and shaking and he's kind of, he's, I just don't know what's wrong. And he said, and he just took it to me. He was like, I think we've made a mistake. And so he went away and he said, you need to go and get home. And I said, I don't have a home. My home's miles away. Um, so I, I found the hotel my husband had been staying at, and I'll come back and explain that a little bit in a minute. Which, But I, I got a room there to where he was staying, and he said, I promise you I'll call you. And then he did call me, and he called me back in in the morning, and unfortunately David had got a really bad bout of meningitis that meant that he was really, really poorly. And because I'd been with him for so long, they then said, well, we need to put you two into a bubble because actually if it, meningitis is really infectious. Mm -hmm. Um, and so we ended up in this bubble with me saying, I think it was at 41 degrees or 42. That shows I'm not a, I'm not a medic. But there was something which said if his temperature got up to 41 or 42, then we had some serious decisions to make. They'd need to look at what they'd have to do to operate on David. And they'd need to look at whether or not I have a C-section and deliver my baby much earlier. And obviously at a very critical time in your yeah. pregnancy. Wow. And so I just sat at the end of the bed in this bubble as they came in all dressed up in all their kind of suits, just watching his temperature go up and up and up and um and they then said to me you need to write me a list of everybody that you've seen in the last two weeks well we'd had to let the hotel know and they'd had a wedding in the hotel so we've still to this, to this day we feel so guilty to that wedding and family but because they were all fine so the good news oh, is good. they were all fine yeah. and there was no issues but to tell them i'm sorry we've had a case of meningitis in our hotel you need to all go and get checked. You all need to go and work it out. Oh, you know, it's an unintended consequence, but we felt awful. And then the weekend before we'd been with family, don't know if that's a common theme, <laughs> but we'd been with family and it was my niece and nephew were tiny and great grandpa was about 95. So all of them, we had to all go and get tested to make sure they hadn't got meningitis, which they hadn't. And then there was a big decision about do we deliver Naomi early or not? And, you know, well done, David, because just as we were having to make the decision, they were like, wait, it's ticking down. It's ticking oh, down. It's wow. ticking down. And so thankfully, we didn't need to make those decisions because I genuinely don't know what I'd have done. And just as my little family unit were all coming together yeah. and a whirlwind of love and care and togetherness, I kind of thought it was all going. And so that was, yeah, a pretty tough time. And, uh, and I still hadn't done a presentation in our monk that I had to do to get the strategy agreed. But it's those times in life where you just have to take a deep breath and just find a way through. And talk to us about that, because it is in those moments where when you're in it, it can feel like it's never going to end or you feel alone or you feel just despair. And for anybody who is maybe feeling like that or they they know what that's like, what? What is the message? I think the message is, you know, I'm a slow learner, aren't I? Because I think I'd have learned it from early in life. But I think I, the message there was I was more worried about great grandpa Godfrey having to get tested and Sammy and Ali having to get tested and the impact we've had in the hotel. I was so worried about we might have impacted so many people 
my head went into everybody else and how we didn't alarm them, but how we got them tested as soon as possible so that we could make sure they didn't have meningitis. And then just have that belief that it it's there's it's got to be okay. So I kind of went into my let's worry about everybody else mode because that made meant I could survive. Um, and and so I think my advice for other people is, you know, make sure you let people in a little bit to help you a little bit more because people want to help and I love being helpful, but I'm sometimes it's harder to take the help yourself. And and you know, and I've, if I fast forward, I think I didn't really realise it. And again, my boss at IBM was brilliant. He ended up sending. I mean, he was very senior in IBM. He ended up sending his driver to go and collect some clothes to bring up to me, which was you know he was right. down in London. I lived at you know things like that. Just they're just for me the little data, which we might come back. The little things I think really make leadership and make um, businesses fly. Mm -hmm. And then I came back to work far too soon, but I was worried about this big presentation. And I think it only really hit me, and it's quite funny, really, when I think back. But where we were in IBM South Bank, it was onto the South Bank, and it was lovely, huge, big glass windows, walls, and all the offices were glass, so you could see everything. And I think it was probably the moment the stress, the exhaustion and everything got to me and I threw up all over this office mm -hmm. and it was mainly men around and all they could do was stand outside the door. I was like, will you just get me a frigging bucket? And it was like, <laughs> just get real and practical. Because they just were like, what do I do with this pregnant woman that's being sick and in a mess? And anyway, I was absolutely fine. But I think that was a moment where it just all came out and was rather embarrassing, it has to be said. But there you go. Um, eventful. Um, <laughs> eventful. So this is while you were at Smart Card. You were gathering all this data, working out the strategy and how it's going to work. And ultimately, it was a different approach that was needed, right? How did you go about communicating that back to your seniors um, who may have been expecting you to come back with a slightly different answer? And how do you think this can help other people have the courage to tell their seniors something that may that they may feel be adverse to what their seniors were expecting. Yes, thank you. Um, the the bit the, the single answer to that, but it's much broader, is data, mm -hmm. data, data, data. Um, and I'll come back to that in gut feel. And I think probably my background again, when I look back to my family business and the the things I was taught. While I was always told to be hugely respectful of hierarchy, which I am and to this day I am, I was always taught never be scared of asking questions and getting wisdom from senior people around you because everyone's a human being mm -hmm. and you need to remember that if they have information to help you, then people like to give. So on that side, I can, I can ask for help all the time when it's work and business uh, rather than anything else. Um, and so I think... The real lesson I had was I asked so many people so many questions. I was just so curious and I kept building this data bank. And then my gut started to go, they are worried about this problem, but I don't think it's a problem that exists. So I then worked really hard to follow my gut, which was saying, so why is it telling me that? And it was telling me that because I couldn't find anybody else that had the similar issue or the investment. We were so ahead of the game. Was it a brilliant concept that IBM had had? Or was it just they were solving a problem that didn't exist? Mm -hmm. And where I concluded was I thought we were trying to solve a problem that didn't exist. Mm -hmm. And I built the data bank and kept trusting my gut to completely build that data bank. And then when I did of the presentation and I did of the big wooden doors and I did of the big corridor and I did of the big people, I kept thinking of mum and dad, they're all human beings. They're all human beings. Smile, mm -hmm. charm, smile. And I think I remember starting by saying, I don't think what you're going to hear is what you want to hear, and I apologise for that. I've tried to do my very best to give you what I think are the facts for you to make some of the big decisions. Um, now, was it right to apologise up front? I don't know. Probably not. Um, but it meant I had this... Suddenly people were like, oh, well, OK, well, well what have you found out then? So mm. I, I somehow managed to create that environment where they were wanting to find out what I had discovered because I was trying to be, I'm sorry, but this is what I think it is and I really need to show you. And every, I remember at the end they said, you know, you haven't got a page that answers any questions. And that goes back to that. If you can be curious and build it, oh yeah, I've done that. Here's the answer, here's the answer here. here. And that's why I believe this is the right decision for IBM, but it's your decision, not my decision. And thankfully it wasn't my decision because it was way above my pay grade at that point. Mm -hmm. um, but it did teach me an awful lot about follow data, trust your gut, 
If it's not coming the way you think, redirect, think outside the box, speak to loads of people, get lots of points of views and then aggregate it up and be really thoughtful on how you're going to tell your story that ends up leading to good decisions. Brilliant. Great. Thank Thanks. you for that. And that, and just to give Great context, answer. you were having to present this to the CEO of IBM at the time. Yes. Luke Gersner, and which is a, a huge organisation. So I think the advice is based on speaking to someone who's very very senior and how to do that in them yeah in a in a in a strategic way but i think that's the other advice i'd give is don't try not to think about their titles because i was i was wetting myself when i was thinking about who he was and what i had to do when i thought of him as a senior individual with lots of experience that wanted me to do this piece of work i was there to help give him some of the thoughts and ideas to help him do his job better and not quite think about how big IBM was and how big and senior he was. And, and I think sometimes trying to help yourself bring context to let you perform at your best is really important. So from IBM, in around the year 2000, you moved to Barclays B2B. Why did you make that move? Uh, well, I learned from the, the first time when I thought it didn't go to Microsoft and I stayed and that was absolutely the right decision. And mm. thank you to Nick Temple for his strong guidance in that. At this point, I had uh, the role before I'd left. I did two roles after Smart Car. One was running ENET, which was a code name for a consortium of banks across Europe that were working together to try and deliver a trading platform. Um, and in that business, it was quite hard because IBM was originally the technology partner. Mm -hmm. And then they were going to buy into the business risk. Right. Then they decided they didn't want the business risk. They only wanted the tech risk, which upset some of the banks. And actually in that environment, I ended up representing the banks back into IBM, which was really bizarre when IBM were paying my wages, <laughs> yeah. um, which was a big element of, I think, in business, you've got to deliver what you say you'll deliver. And I was, it's the first time I think I ever realized how trusted I was with those banks actually asked me to represent them back and negotiate with IBM, yeah. which was a very bizarre thing, particularly when I was quite pregnant with my second child at the time. Um, and so then I went on to do um, a kind of global role in financial services where I ran the dot-com business uh, that we talked about earlier from IBM and, and grew it to a billion turnover, which was all on the dot-com boom. I mean, it was just people were spending money on digital businesses. IBM were a very reliable technology partner. Mm -hmm. We had a number of amazing software partners. We were developing our consultancy. We could do kind of solutions that work locally. So I used to talk about a global strategy and a local implementation. Mm -hmm. So we actually harnessed what we did. So we had the same products and services available globally, globally, but all tailored to local partners and local implementations so we could get the synergies from large to small. Mm -hmm. And so having grown the business to that size, um, then actually one of the banks, which was Barclays, that were involved in that consortium, said, you know that thing we started with IBM? Well, we've been doing it here with Oracle and Accenture. Why don't you come and have your first CEO role, working in a joint venture, trying to do some of what you were trying to create when we created this project with IBM? And so the opportunity to try and pick up the germs of what we were doing there, trying to apply it in a business, look at it from the other side where you really are the customer rather than the supplier and actually have my first CEO role all felt like too good an opportunity to not follow. So that's how I get into taking on that role at Barclays B2B. Um, but it was quite a step because it was the first time that I'd ever been a proper CEO because otherwise in IBM you've got other people doing the functions which are as important as the core sales business or product business. Mm -hmm. um, and it was a joint venture, so I had shareholders for the first time in Accenture and IBM. We had a major outsourcer partner in Oracle. It was run slightly separately, so it meant that we could create our own culture and values and vibe because it was still in that dot com. You can have something slightly different, be part of the big mothership. And so it was an absolute blast, but it was a bit challenging too. Um, and certainly um, having come in being super excited after the first six months, we realized that actually the technology was taking too long. We weren't making the progress we had to make. The strategy was too wide. And so we ended up in our first transformation, which is the first true transformation where I could take some of the lessons I had from my roles at IBM, but actually I had everything to look at, you know, what the costs are, what the roles are. Mm -hmm. And I think for me, I learned about if you can be really clear in your purpose and your vision, 
even if that means that you have to let some amazing people go through redundancy, you have to make the right decisions for a business, but you've got to make sure it's clear about where you're taking the organisation. And if that means you've got to change some structures and some people to get there, and you can communicate it, while people won't enjoy it, and I absolutely understand that, the more you can get people to understand it, the more they can realise it's not about them personally. Mm -hmm. It's about what you have to do to help a business succeed. And that's where I think I kind of have this phrase I talk about, about being ruthless in decision making and compassionate in execution. Because I think we are all human beings. It is humans that make us, but you can't always keep everybody in an organisation when you go forward. Mm -hmm. And so that was a huge lesson to learn while managing stakeholders, managing shareholders, trying to deliver a business. And having done that turnaround, and that's where you have amazing people. And our, to this day, I'm very friendly with our HR director, who ended up becoming godmother to, to my youngest, because she was amazing at helping me work through all these, how do you do these people changes well? Because mm. it's easy to do people changes badly. It's hard to do them well. And she was phenomenal at guiding me and holding my hand and giving me all the support I needed to help make that happen, as was the whole team. But that was a particularly helpful time. And hey, you know, what was really kind of in some ways you could say is a failure um, is that we ended up with Barclays B2B moving towards profitability. And it was mainly we focused it all on procurement services. So if you think about Barclays providing financial services and support, mm -hmm. What this was, was procurement services in a digital platform, again, a bit ahead of itself, mm -hmm. but enabling people to take cost out to help the cash flow and help right. the profitability of the businesses. And so I think it was successful. It was getting towards profitability. But at the time, Barclays was looking at where are they investing their capital and resource and how do you optimize for growth in the group? And the reality was the board had to make the tough decision that even while this was good, it was never going to be big enough to change the dial big enough for Barclays. So we ended up then having to close that business down, roll the people into Barclays procurement team. Um, and wow, yes, so that's two transformations in the two odd years I had in my first CEO role was something I thought we were creating a few years before. But again, you've got to follow the data and then execute it as compassionately as you possibly can. But yeah, quite a journey. Whew. I mean, <laughs> there's so much to just, we could do a whole episode in just that, you know, how did you turn this company around? How did you, how did you get it to profitability? Um, and, uh, and the redundancy side. So let's talk about vision and redundancies. So you've come into this organization, you've seen that there needs to be changes made, quite big changes made, and you've, you're going to have to restructure, you're going to have to make a lot of redundancies. How did you then like, show a vision to the people remaining to keep them motivated and to keep them on board with the changes that were happening around them? Because I believed in it. Mm. I believed in the vision. Mm -hmm. And back to the, it wasn't a set of charts. It was a genuine view based on data mm -hmm. and then based on my vision for where we needed to go that I believed it and I genuinely did. And I think... I can't imagine being a leader leading hundreds and thousands of people if you don't genuinely believe in the organization and what you're doing. And I think possibly back to my uni days, learning how to tell a story is really important, but it's got to be a story that's true or it just doesn't work. And so, I, I mean, again, I, I've always... I feel like I'm always really lucky. I mean, I work really hard, but I'm lucky at finding amazing people. And some of the senior execs at Barclays were super, super support to me in terms of sharing their wisdom, sharing their thoughts, helping guide me in what I do. I had an amazing individual, Keith, who was from Accenture, that was really helping with all the analytics as we worked through the different options. So I think you just surround yourself by the right people. You listen. You don't hear. You listen to what they're saying. And then you pull it together and then you've got to make the shouts. That's your job. And take the board, bring people with you. And we spent a lot of time with our people sharing that vision, answering questions, making yourself available for everybody and anybody to answer any questions. And if we didn't have an answer, we'd say we didn't. We'd take it away and we'd find that answer. And I think for me, that is what leadership is all about. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, you've got to believe it. You can't just sell it. And, and practically, if I'm listening to this now, I'm like, okay, I've got, you know, I'm a CEO or, or a senior leader and I've got to share a vision at some point. Um, practically, how do you do it? You said you've got to, you know, believe in it. You've got to tell a story. 
how did you do it? Do you, do you bring everybody in a room together? Do you have any tactics around how, how it's best done? And how many staff were you having to share this vision with? That one was about 300 odd at the time um, uh, in that organisation. I think practical tips is, I mean, I was lucky because, again, Barclays kindly gave me a mentor, which is the first time I had a mentor. And he was amazing. And so he was there to help me and the company perform to its best ability. So I had a confidant that I had all the way through this, I could bounce ideas off. And it was at a time when I think they were trialing maybe having mentors because it was like, oh, she's obviously young. She's not that experienced. She needs a mentor. How old were you at this time? Oh, how old was I? Early 30s. Okay. Right. Early 30s. Mm. Um, and I think, you know, f for me, I was like, yeah, if someone can help in business, that's it's got to be a good thing. <laughs> I kind of, again, that naivety piece, maybe I was like, well, I'd love to get the help. So I think if you have the opportunity as a senior leader to have a mentor that genuinely is there to be the honest mirror reflection, and even if, if you're talking baloney, you've got to listen when they say that's baloney mm -hmm. because they're not there to tell you it's baloney unless they're trying to help you. Yeah. So genuinely having a and, and, and for me, mentors are not just about you, it's about you and the business so you can have the conversations together. I think practically, I think that's a phenomenal asset if a business will enable you to have it. And then practically, you rehearse it in front of a mirror and you look at yourself and you see, that was awful. And you try again till you've actually got enough of the story to a point where you feel, no, this is how I'm going to introduce this story. And then I always bring people in a room. I, I, I know we're all digital. I know at the moment through COVID, we've got all these amazing virtual meetings, which I use a lot. But when you've got tough news, you need people in a room, you need to be available and you need to make whatever time it takes. They would be the practical tips I would I share. See. So you get um, all those 300 people in a room yeah. and you say, what's the agenda? Do you say, I'm gonna share the vision and then we're gonna have how long for questions? Yeah, and well, you say, look, We've had to make some very difficult shouts about the future of this organisation. We've had to have a big strategic review. We want you to be first to know what that strategic review is. It will have implications for some of you in the business, and I can't shy away from that. But I want to share with you why we're doing it, what we're doing, where we're going, and then we'll talk about, as a result of that, what the implications are for some of you. It's You've just got to do the who, why, what, where, when in a very human way. Mm. Because everybody, those 300 are all starting to think, I might lose my job. Yeah. I see. And any advice on that moment when you have to let people go? What's the, what's the tips? Remember why you're doing it. You know, it, you've got to believe it's the right thing for the organisation because if you keep people and cost and it's not actually what you need in a business, you're not helping anybody. So everybody's going to be out of a job ultimately. So I think you've got to remember to have belief in why you're doing it and back to the, but be as compassionate as you can as you move people through and help them in any which way you as an organisation can afford to help them. You know, and some of these people go off to do amazing things because it's not personal. It's got to keep in mind, it's about roles. It's not about individuals. It's about the roles that are not needed. Those individuals could be super talented and in other organisations they'll fly this is about roles, not people, and it's about getting what's right for the business. But is it upsetting? Yeah. Does it make you really sad? Yes. It's not nice. It's horrible. Mm. Some things in life are. Mm -hmm. And it's a great point you make. It's sort of like what's it's you're you're going for what's the better for all as opposed to one individual. We then reach two thousand and seven, where you move to Kensington Mortgages. You take on this new role just before one of the most financially difficult times in recent memory. Tell us a bit about the condition of the company when you came into this role. So when I first joined Kensington, I was managing director of the mortgages business, the main mortgages business in the UK, which was the main profit generator for the group mortgages PLC, which was a group that then had stakes in two other mortgages companies and also a broker at the time, which are the people that give advice to individual consumers around mortgages. And, and what, so, just give people just an, uh, an idea of the scale of this organisation, how many staff, turnover? And yeah, I mean, we were, we were a FTSE 250, so we were a fairly big organisation. We had thousands of people across the overall group. Um, we were delivering just shy of about, I think it would have been about 70, 80, 90 million profit 
as as we grew, we were doing really well and growing fast. And I joined, originally they looked at whether I could run the broker business, which wasn't really my strength. And then they ended up bringing me into being the managing director of the UK mortgages business. Um, and that was quite a challenging business because we weren't a, what they'd call a main street lender. Mm. Uh, we were looking after people that were maybe self-employed, okay. which meant they might not have regular income, but they had good income. Mm. And I always think personally that people like the self-employed community are actually great people to lend to because they've always got work. The question is how much work have they got? So <laughs> rather than always having a role. So I think for people to say they are high risk, they're a different risk. Mm. But we'd look at our people that had a default in the past but had actually sorted out their debt consolidation. So we were looking after what they used to call near prime. So kind of nearly um, prime where you would do the regular high street or maybe they were much higher risk. So it was a business where we had to evolve and grow. And I spent a good two and a half, three years kind of working with the broker community to get Kensington to a point where it was really valued by the broker for our service to them as well as our products because it was the broker community into which we didn't directly take our mortgages to market. We did it via the broker community. What's the broker community? So the broker community, sorry, that's me getting into jargon. So if you're, if you're looking for a mortgage, you do one of two things. You either go directly to a bank and they will then talk to you and they give you advice for a mortgage that works for you or you go to an independent broker who's got access to all of the people that provide mortgages and looks at understanding and recommending to you who the right mortgage lender is for you as an individual. Excellent. And so across the UK, about 70, 80% of mortgages are typically through a broker community where people go for advice to an independent broker who then looks across a range of, of mortgage lenders. Hmm. Um, and so... For Kensington, we didn't give any direct mortgage advice. It was always through the brokers. And we had to build that broker community. And I hadn't really known anything about mortgages. That wasn't something I knew about. And there wasn't many women that were MDs in that business either. And it was a very tight community. Um, and I remember the first event I went to, my boss at the time took me round and was introduced me, Alison's join us. She's just joining the group to run the mortgages business. And there was this one individual who's an absolute card who just assumed I was his secretary. So I was like, well, I'm not going to tell him I'm not. I'll just keep going. Like, it's saying, You've got fantastic shoes. I was like, yours are not bad either. Thank you. Um, and to this day, I never remember when he rang me the next day and went, oh, my goodness, why didn't you tell me? I said, well, you seem to be enjoying the fact I was his secretary. So I just went, that's fine. Which sure that will teach him. I'll never yeah, make that exactly. mistake again. You know, you can wear high heels and be a uh, managing director or chief executive as well. Uh, but he was actually great and he took me under his wing. He knew a lot about the mortgage industry. He taught me so much. We ended up with a great relationship. And I spent a lot of time out with brokers listening. You know, I mean, back to my model of customers are king. Mm. In this case, brokers are king. So what did they like about us? What didn't they? Where were we taking risk? Where were we not? And we grew that business and we became very popular with the brokers. We kept a consistent level. We did take risk, but we priced for the risk. Mm. And so the business was doing really well. But at a group level, after I'd been there for about two and a half years, it, it wasn't doing so well. The rest of the group wasn't actually delivering the profit that they'd expected mm. to make. I think the board was starting to get a little bit thoughtful about the the way forward. Yeah. And also, um, while this won't mean anything to many people, we only had one big route of funding. So we weren't a bank, so we didn't have our own kind of savings. And so, so our route of funding was in the capital markets through securitization. Mm -hmm. So if that ever shut, we didn't have a route to fund our mortgages. And that was quite a high risk. Um, anyway, I roll forward and uh, a situation happened at the board. And so I was called in to say, great news, Alison. We'd like to appoint you CEO of the group and we need you to help us turn around this business and manage it to a lower risk, higher profitable business. What's going through your mind when you hear that? Um, well, um, I probably can't say that on live on air, <laughs> but it was that. <laughs> it was the first thing I thought of. Um, but the other one was I, I just couldn't process it. I wasn't ready to be a PLC CEO. That wasn't kind of on my horizon. Um, and I remember leaving the building so we were in Paddington to walk along the river just to get my head, what's going on, what's happening. Um, ironically, I think slightly light touch, but me going away to think, what's the job? Can I do it? What would I need to do it? Is this the right time? How can I not let down these 3,000 people have all got mortgages? And I, you know, like my colleagues, I, I, what, what? 
and they came out running after me saying, look, if it's money, we'll sort a package. I was like, no, I'm not thinking about money. I'm thinking about the role, <laughs> which this I think... Is, this is all happening outside the building by the river. This is all happening outside the building. <laughs> <laughs> and ended up in a coffee oh, shop. And then I kind of came back in again and they said, well done in the role. And they were like going, she hasn't agreed to take it yet. And I was like, but we've gifted it. I was like, but, oh, it became one of those oh, moments where I just, you know, I look back in life and suddenly the next day I was a FTSE CEO where we had shareholders to talk about, was there a hole in the accounts? Why were we there? Why, why was there a change of CEO? We'd, I'd never worked with a board that was a PLC board before with all the governance that goes with it. I had a super awesome advisor um, who helped me every step of the way. And he said to me, I will be there for you. I will help you. And he did. And I had fantastic advisors and there's so much I can learn, but wow, that was quite a journey too. So that seems to be the advice here is to get advisors. If you're if you're thrown into a position you don't really feel ready for, you you get advisors around you. How do you get those advisors? Any tips on that? And then how what's the, what have you found is the best best relationship with those advisors? How to get the best out of that relationship? Um, honesty is the answer. To that I always think honesty is the best policy, even though you think they're an advisor, just sharing the facts. And I think. Maybe one of the challenges they had before, although I wasn't around the board, is maybe they weren't looking at the facts as they were because they had a belief system of where it was going and back to that. You can have a belief, but the data's got to follow. And if the data doesn't, you got to question it a little bit. Um, but I think there's two things. So if you're in a crisis which situation, then you need the best advisors because sometimes that means that people that are on the management team might not be the team you need to take with you. Some are, some aren't. If you're trying to drive a long-term success, that's where you hire people better than you in every field that you have around you. Um, so depending on what the situation is, it's either about hiring those what will be long-term advisors because they will be part of your management team, or it's hiring shorter-term genuine advisors who are there to help you through a crisis. And whether that be the PR side, whether it be the capital management side. And I think the way you get good advisors is over the years, you end up forming relationships with people that you really respect. And if you're in an area where you've not been to before, you give them a call and you ask mm -hmm. them, look, if you were in this circumstances, who are the individuals you would trust? And I trust individuals before firms and then the firms will build the credibility afterwards. Mm -hmm. um, so if there was maybe an individual that used to be at that firm but went to that firm, I would go to the individual and then I would get to know the firm. So I think for me, it's, you know, all the amazing people you meet through your journey, if you find yourself, reach out and ask for help and ask for advice. And, and the advisors I had were brilliant and we were just honest. Here is the issues, here are the gaps, here are the options. So it was an honest reflection with the board about the challenges we faced into. And the big challenges, you were starting to get rumbles of what was going on with the financial crisis and whether securitization was the right route. But actually underneath it all, we had businesses that weren't delivering profit. We'd got a cost base at a group level that was far too high where the profits weren't sustaining it. So we had to do a number of things in parallel. As a board, we had to be really clear on what the issues were and what the options were. And we genuinely believed at that point, one of the options was to sell the company and to delist as an organization and take ourselves off the FTSE wow. because we needed to have another source of capital mm -hmm. that as an independent, we couldn't quite see. We looked at opportunities to acquire, but with the financial strength, that didn't make sense. But equally to sell a company, you've also got to make sure it's delivering and performing well and you keep the colleagues and you manage them. And there's so only so much you can say about that. So we had to go through a cost reduction and take an awful lot of cost out of the business, particularly in the middle group layer. We had to get people to understand the vision for for where we were as Kensington and why taking cost out was the right thing. Back to what I'd learnt back in my days with Barclays B2B about set a vision, take some cost out, move at pace because we had to move at pace. Mm -hmm. And that was really hard because we didn't have the time. And then we went about getting the team in place that could then run the business day to day that I'd been running before where we had some good momentum exit some of the other businesses and put ourselves out to market. And it's quite hard when you get the rumblings, of people, oh, Kensington, we think are up for sale. Because you don't tell people you're up for sale. You tell people, look, this is where we're going as a group, but we knew one of the strategic options were. And so then once you get a number of people in due diligence, then you've got to be careful how much data you share because mm -hmm. once one person gets it, they all get it. Mm -hmm. So then yeah. if you share too much, competitors come in and then they know more about it. So it's quite an interesting process you have to go through. Hence, you need really amazing advisors and keep coming back to the facts and keep managing it through and ultimately 
um, Investec bought Kensington and was delisted just before the real financial crisis really hit. Um, but I, all credit to Investec, they were an amazing organisation. So had what a that, journey. Had you not sold at that time, had you not moved as fast, what would what might have happened? I think we would have gone out of business. Wow. And this was literally like the day before the crash was announced, right? Yeah. You managed to get everything wrapped up. So you could say that's a brilliant story. That's where luck really does happen in business. You can't plan for that. There was loads of, I mean, it was late in completing the deal. There's lots going on. You just have to focus on you and what you are trying to do. And we had some other issues. And this ended up being a great deal for our shareholders, uh, given the other alternatives, which is why our shareholders voted for it. And we ultimately delisted. But it was complete luck that we managed to do it on that day. And then actually you start the mortgages market and securitization all started to crumble with Fannie Mae in the States and various others. So, you know, it was it was challenging and I was exhausted because I it was exhausting. Mm-hmm. It was really exhausting. And then I somehow had to find the resilience and the energy to then work with Investec and work out, well, so what now then? <laughs> if we're not there, what now then? And um, they are an amazing organization. And uh, I mean, obviously they weren't happy because nobody would be happy, but they worked with us. We slimmed down the organization. We sold an- we sold another of the mortgage lenders as a hedge to one of the big American firms. And we got it back to size and we got it running well and it was pricing for risk. And later on, Investec held that investment and exited. And, you know, they are a really fantastic organization. Um, but it got to a point where, you know, I kind of did myself out of a job and I, I you know, so I I wasn't a group anymore with all these areas and they didn't really want me to leave, uh, which was very kind of them. Um, but it was time. I, that was a big journey and it was a big chapter and it was time. Um, but then, you know, when I left, they didn't really want me to work for 12 months. So here's me, a kid that started work from a little toddler, finding myself having to work out what I'm going to do with 12 months where I couldn't earn. Mm. So that was the end of that chapter. And what did you do for 12 months in that time after this big, quite stressful scenario? Well, I first learned how rubbish a mother was because I got to know the kids better, which was fantastic, and they loved it. Uh, But one of my children, Fraser, I I am, in my family, a promise is a promise. If you promise, you deliver. Otherwise, you try your best. And it's fine to try your best and not succeed, but if you promise, you deliver. And I must have been in a very weak moment of everything going on at Kensington. And I had clearly promised to Fraser I would have more time to spend with him. And I remember him sitting me down in the bed and saying, Mum, I now know what a promise is. It can sometimes take a very long time, but you're now spending more time with us and I get what a promise is all about. Mm. I nearly messed up. I mean, I don't remember that. And I obviously said it. Um, but how bad would that have been to have my own values for me then to break? And things happen. So, you know, that was, I learned a lot about, you know, sometimes when you're in the eye of a storm, you do things you don't mean to do, not because you're a bad person, but just because... You don't always get it right and you don't always get it right. You're trying to make shouts every day of the week. Um, But after that, I spent time um, learning to be a mentor and helped a number of other people in the financial services crisis where they were wanting to speak to somebody that had experience of what they'd been through. And I'd obviously been through the eye of the storm. Uh, So I helped do a lot of mentoring. I did a lot of community charity work. And then we started this journey of pennies that's become such a huge part of my life. So... Thank you, Investec, because Pennies probably wouldn't have been born without them letting me take a step back. So, Pennies. Yes. As you said, how did this opportunity come about? Did they reach out to you and say, well, we've seen what you've done with uh, in the world of technology and finance, and we think you're the one to lead our charity, even though you've never worked <laughs> for a charity before in your life? So, yes, it was something it, something like that. Um, I'd spent a lot of time as well when I was time off working with um, my mentor that I'd worked with before saying, how do I write one sheet of paper which says, what's the characteristics you really want to find from your next role? So I'd spent a lot of time refining that and it's nothing which I went on to do, but it was a good piece of work that I did. What were you, what kind of roles were you thinking of? What was, what was the plan at that point? So the plan was to be a non-PLC. You don't want to go through Medium size. Uh, I just personally, I think public companies are amazing and shareholder investment's fantastic. And I'm, you know, I sit as a non-executive on PLC boards and you can grow and deliver. I think if you're genuinely going to deliver a long-term sustainable business where you don't have to respond to quarterly reports, it's easier to do that if you're not a public company. Mm -hmm. 
and that's where I set out having a three to five thousand pound uh, three to five thousand uh, colleague company that was either in turnaround or in growth because I'm not very good at status quo that had an ev element of technology that was really customer focused that would have an opportunity for me to cut that was the kind of role I was shaping up that I was hoping to do did you have any companies on that list that you earmarked well I had at the time but obviously I couldn't then work or interview in 12 months is a long time yes. and so you you have to wait to what companies are available at the time. And that's when um, one of the headhunters I was working with said, there's these three people that have got this idea about giving on a card and you've got some payment background, some selling background, some marketing background, some tech background. Would you help them out for a bit? And I was like, yeah, okay, I've got loads of time. Yeah, of course mm -hmm. I can help them out. Um, and when we got together, we realized that what they tried to set up had lots of the germs of an idea but it, it was set up as a for-profit and it didn't quite work and they hadn't agreed the consumer proposition or the business model. And for various reasons that don't matter, we ended up kind of winding that down. But I'd kind of got the taste for the insight they had about giving on a card. Um, and what's super wonderful is one of them uh, is now not part of the core team and they decided to, to move on and we parted ways. Um, one of them, Peter, is my finance director and one of them Julian's on my trustee board so mm. the three of us kind of in different roles and I've played different roles over the period of time and then a good friend of mine from Kensington uh, and she worked with me around her kitchen table and we ended up saying right let's draw this back to basics what is it all about and we went with any business back to customers you know back to this customer is king what do consumers love about giving and right back to the essence, essence of dropping coins a box because it was easy, it was affordable, and it felt good. It was back to why do retailers put them on their tabletops and their checkouts because they get to choose the sticker that goes round the box. Mm -hmm. So there was no way I could have done this with just a few charities, hence that independence. Yeah. Then there was the technology. How does that work? Didn't have a clue. Called in favours from IBM and Ingenico and various tech companies I'd known and Accenture and said, hey, I've got a problem we need to solve. Can you help me solve it? And people gave up their time because they then got the bug for, well, it's a great idea. How can we solve this problem? So we then got a whole lot of amazing technology people for, that I'd met through my past that all came together to try and look at the technology problem and how we might fix that. And then there was a business model. How are we going to make this work? And we went through, do we set up a for-profit, which none of us wanted to do. But if you're a charity, then we looked at, well, maybe the big charities could fund it to begin with out of their innovation pots, and then we can open up to the wider sector. Um, that wasn't to happen. In fact, a few of them did end up going creating an equivalent to what we did, but they didn't come for long. And actually, we now grant out to all of those charities, mm -hmm. which is lovely, mm -hmm. um, because I think they felt this is a new organisation and a new charity. And anyway, we now are, it, it's great, but... We kind of went back to, you know, we have to be independent because the retailer has to nominate the sticker. The retailer needs to get the customer journey. And we obsessed, obsessed by how do we make it easy at checkout? Because retailers don't want you to have oh another decision, which means they don't end up buying the basket, paying for the goods online or oh I've got distracted at checkout. I don't want anything to do with that. So we obsessed because everyone in retail is about frictionless journeys. And hey, we are adding friction in. So we had to make sure that was super, super brilliant, um, which is what we went about doing. And then we concluded that we had to be an independent charity. So then we were all volunteers for the first couple of years before we went out and tried to find some funding where we could start to build the idea, build the proposition, inspire people to join us as volunteers. And I called in loads of friends from family and friends to come and join me on this mission. Um, and then we believed we had something. And yeah, that's how it was born. But hold on a minute, you're a finance and, and and tech, you know, specialist. Do people not say to you, don't think this is a good idea, um, stick to what you know, you know, do you take some time to think about it? Yes, they did. And I did. I did listen to them as well as hear them. And I also had advice from some amazing business people that did a lot of philanthropy to say, be careful, you might find some of the charities are brilliant but actually as a charity you have leaders but you don't have the same shareholder engagement mm. that you get in business therefore sometimes not all charities sometimes the pace at moving the people you can attract you know you're used to moving fast attracting lots of people you're going to find that really hard 
And I said, yeah, but this could be worth a lot for the sector. And so it was, I think for me, it was that vision, which although we set it up as a charity, we're actually running it as a business. So we do everything you would do as a business. It just happens to be none of us want to make money out of it. And we want to create this as a charity endeavor. And and therefore, when I went on to get find a board, you know, we ended up, friends and family introduced me to people and I went back to the very advisor who helped me at Kensington who's now our chairman um. Robert who's been an amazing and amazing counsel and guide to me all the way around the line and I said you probably wouldn't want to do this Robert I know you're really busy and he was like no I'll help I think we should do this and uh, so and then we went out to our trustee board we've tried to find and define like you do as a board what are the skills we need around the board and let's go find the people that can bring those skills that believe in our mission rather than here's our mission, who who fancies joining us? Mm-hmm. So we were quite commercial in the way, mm-hmm. even from the early stages about how we set up and how we drove pennies. And, you know, I, I've always been about how do we inspire people to do things? So we've got to make it easy and affordable for people to give their time as well as ultimately the consumer to give their money. So we've created different business models. And then ultimately, as, as a charity in pennies, our business model is all the money goes to charity but right now 100% goes to charity 90% we grant out to the retailers nominated charity and 10% comes to pennies as a charity Mm -hmm. for us to invest in the technology Mm -hmm. the best practice the customer journeys the learning and to share that with all the partners but once we get sales sustainability that 10 will become 9 become 8 become 7 become 6 because we only want this movement to grow in a charitable way to help as many charities as many people and communities have the help and support that they absolutely deserve if they're in need so if i'm listening to this and i'm thinking i might like to change industries one day or change careers but it's it's too late now you know i've built up this credentials and people know me for whatever i'm doing now what would you say to them I would say, what do you really want to do and what can you afford to do? And I don't mean afford just money. Money's a part of it. I mean, what can you afford to do? Because if if you change sector, and in my non-executive career, I've been very blessed to work across many sectors, which, again, the advice I got was focus and be a specialist. And I was like, "Mm, never be one of those. I'll be a generalist. And kind of that's my thing. But I think you can, it's never too late to change a career, but you might have to accept you go backwards before you go forward. So can Mm. you afford in your own image, financially, uh, in your level of how you feel about that, where you might have been a CEO, but suddenly you're now, if you can get to a point where you really believe in something, why would you worry about going backwards to go forwards? Mm. Because there's not many people that can completely move industry and go up and up. Some can, and that's great, but others can't. And for me, You know, I talk about energy management, not, you know, anything else. And and, and I talk about, you know, how you manage your life choices, not just your work-life balance, because it's about life and energy. But if you're not satisfied and if you're not burning good energy, how long can you keep doing that for? Now, there's some people do it tirelessly because they have to, and there's some amazing human beings that work so hard and don't get the jobs and the benefit and the financial returns that I and others have managed to get and they are superheroes because of their careers and and, and what they've done. Um, But I think you should never be shy about saying, do you know what? Life is about experience and about knowledge and about impact. So does it matter what sector you're in? Does it matter what your title is? That's never mattered to me. And I I laugh when people say, well, when did you know you wanted to be a CEO? I I still didn't know what to be when I grew up. You know, Mm -hmm. it was never about the title for me. It was about the role, the challenge, the impact and how you can drive something forward. Love that. And mm. and we have spoken to almost 50 leaders. Only two have said they wanted to be a CEO uh, <laughs> in earlier life. It's most people get there through um, through a number of things, but, but being extremely mm. competent at what they do and great person to work with and great understanding people and it kind of um, presents interesting opportunities like being a CEO. <laughs> um, and I want to share in terms of this and energy management so- side of things, you know, people are living such busy lives. They've got work demands. They might have shareholders to, you know, um, talk to and, and um, 
deliver for, they have seniors to deliver for, they've got family around, they've got friends. You know, how do you manage, you know, when you're just tired and exhausted and you're trying to get all these things done and trying to please everybody? What's your advice? It's exhausting even listening to your question, <laughs> <laughs> Charles. Um, but it's the truth. Like you said, you've got to truth. tell the facts. Yeah. Tell, the, share tell the, the facts. Share the, the truth data. is it can be exhausting. Um, and where you can, and not everybody can, that's why I talk about life choices. Mm -hmm. Because not work life choices, because many people have to work. Many people choose to work. But if you're working, the jobs you do and the lifestyle, you can choose something that best suits you and if you can't choose it you can work hard in a row to get an opportunity to do something that more suits you mm -hmm. whatever that might be mm -hmm. you know it's like my grandpa was a gardener and I grew up with lots of fresh vegetables because that's what my mum got that's what we got and he loved gardening and he was brilliant at it he didn't earn much money but he loved it and he loved the fresh air and so for me I think and and, and by the way he was just amazing and very funny um but I think in life, you've got to try and think of things that you value that actually feeds your soul and try and find roles that helps feed that soul more and better and earn some income that enables you to survive in life because that's exactly what you have to do. So that's why I say it's life balance. And I think there's nothing short of being a super planner. Um, and as my husband knows, to his detriment, sometimes I am a bit of a super planner. And I need to know what's happening when. You know, like my husband will say, I don't know what I'm doing next week. I say, I know what I'm doing in three months. <laughs> you know, I, I like to plan things out and make time. And my goal, which I don't succeed on too many times, is wherever I'm turning up is to try and turn up as the best version of myself. Whether that be a meeting, whether it be seeing the kids, whether it be in the gym, whatever it might be, if you've planned it to the best possibility, show up and be in the moment. Because if you're not, the person you're with that's not fair on them. So I try really hard to balance that. I don't always get it right. And if I don't, I'll say, look, I'm really off form today. I'm sorry. Can we just, you know, I think just being really honest with people when you're not on form. So you, also, you might say that in a meeting. If you're yeah. having a meeting with someone, you might say, "What? Well, how do you handle it? I'm just fair. I said, do you know what? I'm not feeling I'm giving you all the energy and time you need. I'm really tired. What is the minimum you need? How can we manage it? Can we get back together when I'm more energy? Because I want to make sure we get whatever we're trying to get out of the meeting. Um, but then as people say, Alison's what she is. She wears everything on her sleeve. I'm I'm just an open book. What you see is what you get. <laughs> but I'd rather be honest with people and, and apologise. You know, people get it. Because we're all trying to cope with these different dynamics. Um, and because I just like everything to be a little bit better than where it was, if you haven't helped unlock that, then that's not what I'm about so therefore it doesn't feed what I'm trying to do but yeah being super planner keeping to the commitments making sure you spend time on yourself as well as an individual um which I used to get mainly from family and exercise um then I think you just got to make some choices and never beat yourself up for the wrong choices if you make the choices they're the choices so don't say well if only well then change that choice if you can if you can't totally understand but where you can make choices then you have to live by the choices you make and don't don't look over your shoulder because that's your life. It's your, mm. your pack of cards, your hand, whatever they are, you choose how you play them. Love it. It's great. <laughs> There's loads of gems in here. Um, thank you for sharing that. And as CEO of Pennies, how has your vision evolved as the organisation has evolved? I don't think my vision has evolved. So I think the vision... I think my... Um, my lessons of how difficult it is to get to where we get got to mm. and now my vision for how amazing it could be and it is is the same but my my vision of creating a legacy of feel good giving where everybody and anybody that can afford to is given the option to give a few pennies that add up to be an army of good in communities that is my vision and that has never changed um, the routes to getting there have changed loads. <laughs> so the how, mm -hmm. absolutely. But that vision has never changed. And our amazing partners also help us evolve. Um, so, you know, we've got a number of developments underway at Pennies at a more practical level about how we do it and what we do and where we work. Um, for example, at the moment, we are much stronger in um, brick and mortar and in larger merchants. We've got a 
police and e-commerce, but we've got a big focus this year to really unlock the digital channels, working with a lot of the big platforms like Adobe and Shopify mm. and lots of amazing amazing agencies. Um, that, so that's a big growth for us, as well as the, the major merchants and making sure across any retailing channel, whether it be an app, online, kiosk, checkout, if a retailer wants to, they should have the ability to give their customers that option. So it's all those types of things that have changed. And at the moment, we're not able to support smaller businesses. And yet you think of all the entrepreneurs like my mum and dad that are around that are typically valued, typically want to give to the community. I'm sure would love to have something like pennies where you live locally, you shop locally, you give locally, you help locally. Mm. Um, we're not quite there yet, but we're on with it. And we've got a couple of partners we're developing it with. So there's loads of new developments and ideas but the vision, it's the same as it was from the first day. And for, 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 for sort of business owners listening, um, or people running businesses, how do you balance uh, profitability mm -hmm. and social causes or social responsibility um, together? What, what have you found is the best way to, to do that? I think every business needs to decide for themselves. Um, and I think you get businesses that are more naturally that way. Um, I think there's that back to that old people, profit and planet. And I personally add peace into that because I think with everything going on globally and with the diversions of views and sometimes in so many things, if we can find an element of peaceful outcome that drives profitability and planet and amazing people, that's got to be a good thing. And so I think for me, it is a balance. But if, if you can't attract the right colleagues and the like, to the back to what I said, my second lesson: attract the best people and keep them. These people want to work for companies that care about the communities they operate in, and the generation coming up want that more than ever. And they are far more likely to change careers and move in a way where my generation will go. Well, I've become the specialist, as you asked me earlier. How do I move? I think the younger generation will have two or three or four careers, and that's fantastic. And they want to feel that they're working for ethical businesses that are also adding value to communities. So I think you've got customer, customer demand growing anyway. I think you've had a phrase called ESG, the Environment, Social and Governance, which for shareholders and stakeholders and boardrooms, 10 years ago would probably have been CSR or community sport, but now are fundamentals to business and how we make sure we measure our carbon footprint and reduce it and the targets we've all got to try and get to net zero and the reporting we have to do. But when you look underneath that, a lot of companies do something called a materiality assessment. You know, what are the big risks that you have in a business? And more often than not, that comes down to people and talent. And so if you don't make time to give back to the communities where those people come from, where those customers come from, I really question how you can be a sustainably growing business. But ultimately, you can't just give it all for free. It's got to be commercially grounded. Mm -hmm. But if it can be commercially grounded, then I think there's massive opportunity. And what we find with pennies is pennies is just one of those relatively small and easy things they can do where they can bring scale to the giving and scale to their charity partners in a way that all of the fundraising by colleagues and all of the fundraising with customers, this can take something that's giving 50,000 a year to giving 500,000 a year. Mm. And so companies like that, and when it's proven with customers, where every time we enable pennies, immediately customers donate. There's no lead time, they donate and they enjoy donating. And colleagues feel really proud of the fact that they have maybe worked in a bit of the technology to enable that to happen. You get this whole feel good factor circling around, which is relatively simple, but yet quite transformational. I don't know many amazing business people that don't like to feel they're giving back as well. I think now might be a good time if I, because I'm thinking if I'm listening to this and I'm, I'm run a business or have mm. the capacity to do so, I'm like, sign us up to Pennies. <laughs> let's get this going. How do people do it? Oh, just reach out to Pennies. We're online. We've got phone numbers. Give me a call. Drop me a line on LinkedIn. Um, we love having conversations with people. And if you've got people going, yes, but you haven't thought about our technology stack or but you don't. And any issues you've got, come and talk to us because either we've seen it before and we'll give you some examples of how we've overcome it or we'll lean into the issue you're raising and we'll find hopefully a way to solve it. So, you know, anybody that's out there that would love to, we just love having conversations, but it's their choice if they want to do it and it's their choice in the charity. But, you know, I think we'd have a lovely conversation and hopefully together we could unlock a step change. And let's, let's just also remember the charity sector is not immune to this cost of living crisis. 
they are finding fundraising very tough at the moment. And I think the last research I saw was 40% of people expect themselves to be reducing the reserves in the next six months. And yet demands on those charities have increased mm. with the pressures in so many organisations like the NHS that we know, but just the pressure for people's mental health, the pressure with cancer. You know, these charities have demand outstripping supply. So if we can make this tiny little humble penny where 60% of people won't bend down and pick it off a street, but make them go together and make them a force for good, that's going to be a good thing. So come and talk to us and let's explore your journey and let's explore what you're interested in and what your issues are and see what it takes us. Love that. If you could bring together all of the leaders within the charity slash charity tech sector, what do you think the most important thing to discuss should be? I think the most important thing to discuss would be people and talent because I'm a great believer it's talent that unlocks all of this technology. I really, really do. Um, but if I take that as a given then I think it's about how can we share technology and how can we share ideas more? Because as a sector, there's so, there's thousands of charities all doing amazing things. If you stepped outside and brought all these CEOs together, I'd be saying, how can we make it more efficient to get more of these funding and resources out to helping the people or the animals or the situations that we're trying to help? Because I think there's massive efficiency and effectiveness benefits if the sector came together and really shared best practice and listened to business and embraced it at pace. That's what I'd be saying. Come on, we know we could become far more efficient and effective than we are if we work together. Let's do it. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that's a what powerful a message to, to end on. Thank you very much for sharing the story. And that is how you became CEO of Pennies. Well, thank you. Um, Yes, interesting when you ask me all these questions, you go back through your life, you go, oh, how did that happen? <laughs> so thank you very much. Well, I think that we're going to come to your final poem, which Ash has been writing as we go. Oh, Ash, I'm very excited or daunted. What should I be? I'll, listen with, I'll be listening hard. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, I think one of the main things people can learn from your story is, uh, well, there's, there's loads actually. Um, but I think that idea of, not being afraid to change direction and career or business or life um that it's it's okay it can be done and it has been done successfully um it's just breaking through that fear or like you did you you were sort of forced into a phase where you had to not do anything but speak to lots of you had the chance to speak to lots of people and had you not done that this penny's opportunity may never have happened so just shows you when you do create some time to just chat to people and, and see what's going on, the opportunities come out, come about. They do, and I think that's right. I think people should never be afraid, but they should definitely look out and get help because everyone can help somebody. You know, I mean, it, it's unbelievable. People love to help. It's just remarkable. We think people are selfish. They're not. They're really selfless. They want to help, and so... Don't be scared of asking anybody at any level or any background any question because as long as you're respectful and polite and smile, then actually there's so many people out there that can help people. So just don't be afraid, don't be alone and go do things you never think is possible in life. I mean, hey, I bungee jumped and I'm petrified of heights. I survived. <laughs> I nearly didn't. I found out at the time that my son was about five weeks. I was five weeks pregnant with my son at the time, but he's turned out all right too, so that's okay. Yes. Now, I'm not suggesting a bungee jump, but what I'm saying is sometimes you have to just take the plunge and have the faith. Mm, love that. And I think if there's one thing I take from your story and what you shared with us, it's the importance in believing in your decisions and not faltering from that when you've made that decision. I think that can be really helpful to a lot of people, especially people that may think things over a lot or reflect on things they could have done to kind of sit and say, I made that decision. I stand by it and I move forward it can be a really quite simple but helpful thing for a lot of people, including myself. Thank you. So here's your poem mm -hmm. I've taken from, from our chat. Being ready at pole position, but being forth in line to the kindness that people are already showing. Despite falling flat, let's not forget that. You can pick yourself up, dust off and keep going. The most informed decisions can inform your position through data, expertise and aggregation. And when it's time for tough decisions, 
if you're in that position, believe in your why despite the implications. To not feel lost or pay costly costs, the best advisors or mentors can be the solution. A good mantra to hold if the truth is to be told. To be ruthless in decision, but compassionate in execution. Network and teamwork can sure make the dream work, boosting charity connected through technology and refining new models takes time despite wobbles to bring in something truly great with pure honesty. Oh, Ash, that's so touching. Thank you so much. Thank you for what joining a talent us today. you are. Thank you.